Mr. Speaker, I stand before you to deliver my maiden budget policy address. As Parliamentary Representative for Castries East, Prime Minister and Minister for Finance. I am indeed humbled by the significance of this occasion. It marks a defining moment in my public service life. I know that this moment is not lost on my constituents. The good people of Castries East who have been with me throughout this journey. I want to thank them immensely for their unwavering support over the last 25 years. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, through you, I want to begin my address by telling this parliament and the people of St. Lucia who we are and what we stand for as a government. This is very important, Mr. Speaker, so that the citizens of St. Lucia at home and in the diaspora understand what motivates and drives this government. Mr. Speaker, I was nurtured by my parents, a teacher and a policeman, with the values of honesty, hard work, humility, and service to others, especially to the less fortunate. These values continue to guide my life. On the 26th day of July, 2021, the people of St. Lucia voted for the St. Lucia Labour Party with an overwhelming mandate under the slogan, putting you first. Mr. Speaker, putting people first was not just a campaign slogan, but a long-standing commitment of the St. Lucia Labour Party over the last 72 years. A commitment initiated by our founding fathers under the leadership of Sir George F. L. Charles that has been passed down to generations of labor leaders and has remained the lodestar of this government. This government stands on the shoulders of these leaders in the call for bread, freedom, and justice, which echoed in the halls of the trade union movement and gave birth in 1950 to the mother of all political parties in this country, the St. Lucia Labour Party. <laughs> At the core of our value system, is a fundamental belief in social justice and wealth creation, a belief that every man, woman, and child should have an opportunity to reach their full human potential. Mr. Speaker, in our development agenda of putting people first, we shall ensure that government is accountable to the people and no one is held above the rule of law. Our leaders are held accountable and be held to the highest ethical standards. All St. Lucians have the opportunity to establish productive business enterprises. Every St. Lucian has access to quality education and lifelong learning. Every St. Lucian is entitled to affordable, accessible, and quality health care. Every St. Lucian is encouraged and empowered to protect the integrity of the environment and the patrimony of their country. An acceptance of the importance of the role of the family in building the social fabric of our society. Mr. Speaker, my government intends to govern by the principles of inclusiveness, accountability, equity, meritocracy, and the rule of law, so that corruption, wasted, and inefficiency are minimized. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, these principles are a sure way of alleviating the plight of the poor and disadvantaged in our midst. Nelson Mandela's observation remains true today, as it was then, that poverty remains the greatest challenge facing humanity and therefore demands the attention of every person of conscience. Far too many full-time workers are earning too little to meet their basic needs. The pandemic truly exposed the plight and vulnerability of many low-paid workers. As the leader of a party that is guided by the principles of bread, freedom, and justice, my government will lay the foundation to ensure all workers earn a living wage. As part of efforts to promote decent work, employers will be encouraged to provide living wages to employees, thus ensuring that workers, their families, and their communities can live in dignity. Towards that end, 
we shall be reviewing the related provisions in the Labor Act to address this issue. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that in spite of the harsh economic times, my government this month has paid public servants the promised salary increase. This is another illustration of our commitment to the workers of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, we govern with conviction, with creative minds, and with caring hearts. This is who we are. Mr. Speaker, there are two global developments that are significantly impacting St. Lucians and the rest of the world. Rising inflation and the war in Ukraine. Inflation in the United States, our largest trading partner, has reached the highest level in 30 years, 8.5% during the first quarter of 2022. Both developments have increased the price of consumer goods and fuel, reducing the buying power of St. Lucian consumers. Mr. Speaker, in 2021, most economies saw some level of recovery from this historic COVID-19 pandemic-induced contraction in 2020. The global economy recorded its strongest post-recession recovery in 80 years, with growth estimated at 5.9% in 2021 from a contraction of 3.1% in 2020. Growth in the United States economy was estimated at 5.6% in 2021, but projected to slow down to 4% in 2022. Closer to home, Mr. Speaker, economic developments in CARICOM region have been mixed in 2021. Economic growth in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union is estimated at 3.9%, while in Ghana, we continue to see double-digit growth because of developments in its offshore oil industry. Notwithstanding the challenges and uncertainties of the COVID-19 pandemic and other external downside risks, the good news is that the EC dollar remains strong, with a US dollar backing of 95.7% compared to a minimum statutory requirement of 60%. Mr. Speaker, following the pandemic-induced historic downturn in 2020, the domestic economy continued to be influenced by developments in the global economy, exhibiting signs in 2021 of a steady path towards recovery amidst the persistent adverse effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pace of rebound was, was, however, dampened by the adverse effects of Hurricane Elsa. Preliminary estimates suggest that real GDP growth increased by 12.2% in 2021, rebounding from the sharp contraction of 24.4% in 2020. Mr. Speaker, it should be noted that despite this high growth rate, the value of real GDP in 2021 was still 15% below that of 2019. This increase in economic activity was because of growth in the tourism and construction sectors, with positive spill-off effects on other sectors that were hard hit by the pandemic, such as retail and wholesale trade, manufacturing and transport. The number of stayover visitors increased by 52.4% in 2021, after falling by 69.1% in 2020, representing just under half of the 2019 levels. Overall, the increase in stayover visitors was because of pent-up demand for leisure travel, phased relaxation of global travel restrictions and health protocols, and an increase in elite capacity from our main source market, the United States of America. During the year, more hotel rooms became available as more properties received COVID-19 certification. Arrivals in the last quarter of 2021 were just over one quarter below that of the same period in 2019. Visitors on the U.S. market accounted for 76.4% of total stayover arrivals. Mr. Speaker, during 2021, there was significant pickup in construction activity, mainly because of public sector projects. Real GDP growth in this sector is estimated to be 20% in 2021. Construction expenditure by the public sector increased by 90.7%, to a record high of 264.2 million led by central governments. Global supply chain bottlenecks and sharp rises in input costs hampered the magnitude of the recovery in, in manufacturing output in 2021. Real value in the manufacturing sector is estimated to have increased 
by 4.3% in 2021 after contracting by 4% by 0.4% in 2020. This was largely due to an increase in the production of alcoholic beverages. Mr. Speaker, the ongoing recovery in tourism and the wider domestic economy boosted livestock production, while supply-side shortages caused by Hurricane Elsa led to a setback in crop production and exports, particularly in the second half of 2021. Banana exports continued on a downward path, declining by 45.4% to 4,583.2 tons with a value of 6.2 million. Due to, the, due to the deterioration in market access and the closure of Winfresh in, in mid-2020, banana exports to the UK fell by two thirds to 1,662.2 tons, generating revenue of 3 million. Despite a 45.7 rebound in hotel purchases, the combined record output of non-banana crops sold to hotels and supermarkets fell by 3.5% to 4,201.9 tons at a value of 17.5 million. The output of livestock exceeded pre-COVID-19 levels as the combined output of chicken and pork grew by 21.2% to 2,642.6 tons, amounting to 42.4 million. Improvements in both supply and demand led to a record high egg production of 1.8 million dozen, valued at 10.9 million in 2021. In the fisheries subsector, while marine capture expanded by 8.9% to 1,022.6 tons at a value of 22.1 million due to increased fishing trips and consumer demand. Overall, Real value added in the total agriculture sector is estimated to have increased by 5.1%. Consistent with the general recovery of the domestic economy, there was an increase in the number of persons employed in the last quarter of, in the last quarter of 2021 relative to the first quarter. Available estimates show that overall an the unemployment rate was 21.9% in 2021, while the youth unemployment rate stood at 37%. As a result of external developments, domestic consumer prices continue to trend upward in the second half of 2020. On average, consumer prices in the domestic economy rose by 2.4% in 2021 compared to 2020 as demand for goods and services picked up rapidly. This largely reflected higher import prices coupled with strained global supply chain bottlenecks due to the pandemic and weather events. The escalation in global oil prices, persistence disruption in shipping logistics, including availability of containers, pushed up freight costs to a new high and exerted inflationary pressures on domestic prices, particularly for electricity, petroleum products, and construction materials. Mr. Speaker, in this financial year, to enable evidence-based decisions in, col in collab collaboration with the World Bank, we shall be implementing a data for decision-making project. The project has two components, the first of which is a modernization and strengthening of the capacity of the Central Statistical Office. The second component will be a data production analysis with a focus on the population and housing census, living conditions, labor market surveys, agricultural census, and crime victimization surveys. This is the single biggest project ever undertaken by the Central Statistical Office. On the census alone, in excess of 500 enumerators and 100 supervisors will be employed. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need to address the issues of productivity if we are to remain competitive. In this budget, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that to become globally competitive, we need to address the following areas. Speeding up the process of technological transformation, strengthening entrepreneurial capacity, capacities, continuing promotion of innovation, and strengthening our human capital through skills training. Mr. Speaker, global oil prices, like all marketable products, are a function of demand and supply. During the global pandemic, the slowing in global activity resulted in a fall in demand and price for crude oil and related problems and related petroleum products like gasoline, diesel, and cooking oil. 
as the world recovers from the worst pandemic, economic activity has increased, and so has the price of crude oil and related petroleum products. This price increase has worsened because of the Ukraine-Russian war, with oil prices reaching unprecedented levels. The impact of these global events has left the local consumer with very high fuel prices, much in the same way it has in other countries in the Caribbean region and beyond. The desired excise tax on gasoline and diesel was set at $2.50 per gallon by the last Labour administration. This was subsequently increased by $150, presumably to be placed in a lockbox for road improvements, bringing the excise tax to $4 per gallon. Had this policy been kept, the current price of fuel, which is subject to change every three weeks, would be $19.08 as opposed to the current price of $15.95 per gallon. <laughs> Presently, based on current prices, the government is only able to collect $0.80 cents and $0.88 cents per gallon on gas and diesel, respectively. The significantly lower excise tax on fuel is reflected in the current estimates of revenue. Mr. Speaker, Consumers of cooking gas have had to suffer similar price increase pressures, which we have had to cushion by subsidizing the 20 pound cylinder in the amount of $22.17 per cylinder at a monthly cost of about $1.6 million. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, this is the real and true story behind the current increase in fuel prices. Mr. Speaker, to fully appreciate where we are today, it is important to understand the state of affairs of the country on July 26, 2021. Upon coming to office, the state of government finances was found to be in a very poor state. Mr. Speaker, I wish it were not so, because of the immense challenges my government has had to face to keep the economy afloat while trying to manage the deadly Delta variant and the highly contagious Omicron variant. Under the previous administration, COVID-related borrowings from regional international creditors amounted to $223 million. And as of July 31, 2021, $201 million had to be drawn down, leaving $19 million available for future use. Hotel and private property owners whose properties had been used as quarantine sites and as accommodation for Cuban medical personnel were owned several million dollars. Contractors engaged by the last government ostensibly to help in the management of the OKU hospital were owed over to US $2 million for their services. Yet, Mr. Speaker, $7 million was found to make an advance payment for vaccines to an unusual source, which, which we have yet $7 million was found to make an advance payment for vaccines to an unusual source which we have yet to receive, we have yet to receive, with five million still being recovered. Still yet to be recovered. Seven million paid, five million still to be recovered. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, access to safe and affordable vaccines is critical to a sustainable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, and the government provides free vaccines to allow the best chance for increased vaccine uptake. We continue to encourage, encourage the population to vaccinate by increasing access at the community level, increasing access to education, and providing incentives for vaccinations. With the support of multilateral agencies like the World Bank and UNDP, we, con we continue to take steps to reduce the high level of vaccine hesitancy and to increase the vaccination uptake towards herd immunity which is 70% of the population. Mr. Speaker, for the financial year April 20 to March 21, the economy contracted by 24.4%, the largest decline in the Eastern Caribbean Monetary Union and the sixth in the world. At 3.9 billion, we, have the, we had the largest public debt in the Monetary Union with debt service accounting for 41% of government revenue. Payments due to local suppliers stood at 154 million. 
design finance, contra design finance contracts so that 184.5 million. These contracts were untendered contracts for road building which were repairable within three to five years. Unpaid land acquisitions, 60 million. Money owed to University of the West Indies, 27 million. CDP debt of 4.18 million and growing. Under this mountain of debt commitment at the time, this administration com committed to addressing the following critical areas. Debt servicing, financing COVID-19 demands, strengthening healthcare delivery services, and giving much needed support to the education sector in the form of the payment of facility fees for over 25,000 secondary school students. <laughs> Supplying over 12,000 electronic devices to students. Paying CXC fees for students taking mathematics and English. Mr. Speaker, the sad reality of our situation is that the government has been financing much of its debt commitment by rolling over its bonds and treasury bills and short-term financing. For the last eight months, until this budget cycle begins, we have had no access to institutional lending as this avenue was exhausted by the last administration. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in our assessment of the socioeconomic landscape of our country, we have identified seven major challenges confronting St. Lucia as a small, open, and vulnerable island state with minimal natural resources. One, achieving sustainable high levels of economic growth that support economic transformation and poverty reduction. Two, securing fiscal and debt sustainability. Three, building resilience and adaptation to climate change. Four, reducing high levels of unemployment, especially among the youth. Five, enhancing citizen security. Six, creating a culture of good governance and intolerance towards corruption. And seven, creating the global citizen. Mr. Speaker, it's against this background that we have prepared the 2022-2023 budget to begin the process of transformation of our society and the empowerment of our people. Mr. Speaker, one of the major challenges facing our country is youth unemployment, which remains high on the government's priority. Youth disenchantment continues to be a, a perennial problem with over 15,000 young people unemployed, despite several related youth-related business programs conducted by NGOs and public and private sector agencies operating in St. Lucia. It's because my administration believes that every young person, irrespective of their socioeconomic circumstances, has the potential to make a positive contribution to the development of the community that we have taken up the responsibility to address the apparent deficiencies in the existing youth-related business programs. In addressing these deficiencies, my government will not duplicate existing initiatives, but will support the ones that work and supplement them with new and innovative ideas that meet the needs and aspirations of the youth. In the last general election, we promised to create a special place in the economic system for young people to develop and grow their ideas, a youth economy. Mr. Speaker, the youth economy aims at transforming hobbies into entrepreneurship and skills into business by providing committed young people with finance, training, mentorship, and marketing supports. The youth economy will provide support services and business opportunities for young persons with interest in activities such as sports, music, entertainment, the literary and performing arts, modeling, designing, writing and directing, agriculture, agro-processing, blue economy, and the green economy. The youth economy will be managed for a statutory board with its own board of directors to avoid unnecessary bureaucratic and to allow for timely decision making that is consistent with a modern business environment. The statutory board will collaborate in the formulation of outreach programs in communities with public and private sector social partners with particular emphasis given to at-risk urban and rural youth. The membership of the board will be gender balanced with adequate youth representation. 
the stiletery ball. The stiletery board will address four focal areas: training, marketing, finance, loans and grants, and mentorship. Training will consist of the strengthening of existing and viable business enterprises, identification of workable new business ideas and opportunities, research and development, innovation and technology upgrade, certification and capacity building with training strategic planning, skill and talent development, emotional intelligence, and the implementation of international standards and best practices. Marketing to include market research, assistance with branding and packaging, the use of e-commerce, website design development, and social media platforms. Finance and grants. For the purchase of equipment, for existing and viable businesses, the refurbishment of equipment and smart technologies, the provision of working capital, and support for new and emerging economic sectors in the blue, green, and orange economies. Mr. Speaker, Talented youth from low-income families should not be denied the opportunity to monetize their skills because they cannot afford the necessary equipment. Talented young athletes should no longer be denied the opportunity to participate in regional or international competitions because of the lack of access to finance to purchase sporting gear and to secure travel arrangements. These impediments will be corrected. Mentorship will cover exposure and appreciation for best business practices, the development of discipline, the need to be accountable, and the value of persistence. In keeping with the government's commitment to the young people, an amount of $10 million is provided for the youth economy under the, the department of economic development in the estimates of 2022-2023. The youth economy is the first step in transforming the solution economy, driven by technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship, where young people, regardless of their socioeconomic backgrounds, can become active participants in wealth creation and nation building. Mr. Speaker, the, develop the development of St. Lucia's infrastructure has been identified as a critical component of the overall strategy for improving St. Lucia's economic, social, and environmental performance. The development and upgrading of St. Lucia's infrastructure in roads, air and seaports, water supply, sanitation, energy generation, and telecommunications are critical to raising productivity and living standards. In the medium-term development strategy, infrastructure has been identified as one of the economic pillars for the acceleration of economic growth. Moreover, several reports have been prepared on the future infrastructure needs of the country, as well as outlining the financing strategy for infrastructure. There is an urgent need to consolidate these documents and prepare a comprehensive integrated infrastructure plan up to 2040. Infrastructure 2040, this period coincides with the commitment to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. <clears throat> the Ministry of Infrastructure is pursuing the development of an infrastructure plan for 2040. This plan is to be guided by reports and documents recently completed for the government of St. Lucia on various aspects of infrastructure development. This exercise is expected to identify gaps in, inf in infrastructure development. In fulfillment of this government's promise, and our absolute commitment to putting people first it is our intention in this financial year to launch a bold, ambitious, and visionary infrastructure plan. The plan will span the next eight years into the landmark year of this decade, 2040. Infrastructure 2040, as it's dubbed, will present a clear vision for the upgrade, redevelopment, and expansion of Senusia's infrastructure in keeping with our dreams, aspirations, and needs as we transform the socio and economic landscape of our country. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Millennium Highway West Coast Road project is intended to improve access to Ansari, Canaries, and Sufre, home to our major tourist attractions. 
Work has started on the upgrade of the Millennium Highway West Coast Road, which is estimated to cost $76.01 million, EC dollars, which will be funded as follows. UK SIF grant funding, UK SIF grant funding, $53.14 million. The CDB, EC, $9.39 million. The ROCT and World Bank loan financing, $13.02 million. This project is expected to create employment for between 250 to 300 persons. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, on March 23, 2015, a loan agreement was signed with the Kuwait Fund for Arab Economic Development for an amount of $32.1 million for 20 years with a four-year grace period at an interest rate of 3% as part of the financing for the shock to Grosley and secondary road improvement project. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, the, U the UWP administration canceled the loan and instead embarked upon a series of interventions, interventions, the last being the Rodney Bay Improvement Project, at a cost of nearly $16 million for less than one mile of road. Mr. Speaker, a review of that project has revealed irregularities, and that will be the subject of further investigation. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to announce that we have begun discussion with the Curity Fund for the reinstatement of the financing for the original project. the Viewfort Water Supply Redevelopment Project, which is being executed by WASCO, aims to create an efficient, reliable, climate resilient, and sustainable supply of potable water to all residents and businesses of Viewfort and its environs. The project involves the construction of two water intakes, installation of a treatment plant, and three pumping stations, as well as consultancies on on gender impact evaluation, watershed management, water audit, and energy efficiency. The project, which is funded by a US $21.67 million loan from the CDB, is expected to be completed by August 2022. Upon completion of the project, water will be transmitted to Bonchejou, to Binfield, to Ogier, and Latouni, with new storage tanks installed at Labrie, Latouni, and Grace. The project will have a major impact on the socio-economic life of the southern part of the, of the island, with the daily supply of water from the system expected to be augmented from 1.4 million gallons to 4.5 million gallons. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, much has been said about the John Compton Dam Rehabilitation, JCD, or the Silton Project. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the original design until changed by the UWP administration was phase one, to construct the sediment disposal area, SDA, and the silt the immediate area around the second water abstraction port, an amount of 136,000 cubic meters of silt. Two, to commence and undertake a long-term desilting operation to effectively remove the accumulated volume of silt, 1.5 million cubic meters, and to continue to provide maintenance operation judging in the future. The original phase one was intended to be a single project contract to facilitate efficiency, cost containment, and avoid possible claims. The UWP government, against the advice of the CDB and project consultant, divided the project into two components. JCD1, to construct the sediment disposal area, and JCD2 to undertake the desilting around the second abstraction port and other additional works. Mr. Speaker, to date, an amount of $51.8 million, inclusive of finance costs, commitment fees, consultancy, and perhaps other payments, has been spent on JCD1 and JCD2 financed by $25.9 million, derived from consumers' contributions of 10.43% of 
of the monthly water bills for JCD1 and EC 14.1 million of a loan from the Caribbean Development Bank for JCD2. Mr. Speaker, I have been informed that the SDA or JCD1, although complete, has not met the design specifications. JCD2 also did not achieve the design specifications as only 84,700 cu cubic meters of sediment were removed compared to the design volume of 136,000 cubic meters. The dredging, the dredging fund has been depleted and today has a balance of only 2.6 million. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, a mechanical dryer purchased by Wasco at a cost of $662,447.87 never functioned, could not be repaired, and reportedly the vendor could not and cannot be located for recovery or recourse. Wow. Wow. Mr. Speaker, a mechanical dryer purchased by Wasco, purchased by Wasco, at a cost of $662,447.87, never functioned, could not be repaired, and reportedly the vendor, the person who they bought the dryer from, cannot be located for recovery or recourse. Mr. Mr. Speaker, this is the this is the record. This is the record of the former government led by the current leader of the opposition on the matter of the desilting of John of the John Compton Dam. Mr. Speaker, we hope and we will get to the root of this problem, and we will continue and complete this project to ensure the people of St. Lucia have a reliable supply of water. Mr. Speaker, my government has decided that the much-discussed halls of justice will be constructed at the site of the old police headquarters on Lower Bridge Street. The process of consultation was initiated with the establishment of a committee comprising the Attorney General's Chambers, Department of Economic Development, Department of Physical Planning, the Bar Association, and the Judiciary. The committee's mandate is to ensure a fit-for-purpose building is constructed, having reviewed and updated existing plans. It is anticipated that the project will be built for a built, operate, lease, and transfer bolt arrangement after the completion of consultation and approvals are finalized. This is a departure from the reckless and irresponsible approach taken by the last administration. Mr. Speaker, in this financial year, we expect to commence work on the construction of the Grozny Police Station, a project long anticipated by the Grozny Police Force. Mr. Speaker, the project will be financed via a bold lease transfer arrangement with NIPRO at an estimated cost of $45 million, inclusive of furniture, fixtures, and fittings. The buildings of the halls of justice and the Grosley Police Station are expected to generate over hundreds of direct construction jobs. Mr. Speaker, the redevelopment of the Hiwanora International Airport is necessary if we are to adequately, adequately service existing and increase air passenger traffic, anticipated to reach over a million passengers in the near future. Mr. Speaker, my government's commitment to the redevelopment of the Hiwanora International Airport dates back to the period 2011 to 2016, when we were in office. Mr. Speaker, you would recall, during that period, the government of the Labour Party administration pursued a public-private partnership model with the assistance of the National, Financial Corp International Finance Corporation, IFC of the World Bank. This followed rejection by the bank of the UWP-led administration's questionable arrangement with Asphalt and Mining, a and Consortium, for the redevelopment of the Iwanora International Airport. On, on, the, 
under the IFC model, the PV arrangement was structured as a 40-year concession on, under which Slasper and the government of St. Lucia would retain ownership and regulatory oversight of the Huano International Airport. Under the arrangement, the government would receive concession fee revenue and corporate income taxes paid by the private investor, estimated at EC 1 billion and EC 580 million, respectively. The private investor would be responsible for the design, construction, and financing of the entire reconstruction project. For the 40-year life of the concession, the investment program was estimated at US 118 million in capital costs and US 90 million, 90 million in maintenance costs. The government of St. Lucia will be insulated from any cost overruns under the PPP arrangement. Mr. Speaker, the PPP arrangement would have had no impact on St. Lucia's indebtedness and its debt to GDP ratio, an important metric in accessing the country's creditworthiness. Mr. Speaker, as we all know now, and for reasons best known to them, the UDAP government in 2016 abandoned this model for the airport redevelopment and instead pursued the high risk option of loan financing and secured funding of US 175 million or EC 470 million from the Export Im Import Bank of the Republic of China and a consortium of Caribbean banks to construct a new terminal. Mr. Speaker, in August 2021, Cabinet appointed a committee to review the scope and financing arrangements of the Huanoa International Airport and to de determine advice on the possibility of fiscal space in the said financial arrangements to allow for relocation of funds to other high priority projects approved by cabinets. Mr. Speaker, the study confirmed the dangers which we had cautioned the UWP administration against. Already, long construction delays and massive cost overruns have been plaguing the Huanoa International Redevelopment Project. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, there have been several irregular matters of concern that we have discovered in the HIA Redevelopment Project. The main contractor was handpicked without tender under written instructions from the former Prime Minister to the St. Lucia Air and Seaport Authority. The original location of the terminal was changed again under instruction from the former Prime Minister to an area nearer a river, requiring 10 times more piling than the original location. The cost implications of that uninformed and reckless decision of the former Prime Minister resulted in an increase in piling costs from EC 4.8 million to EC 48.6 million. Mr. Speaker, the legal firm which was retained as Slasper's external counsel was paid an addition of $1.689 million for the vetting of the changes in the agreements relating to the project. Mr. Speaker, the review also indicates that there are considerable administrative and contractual issues related to the project. Those identified shortcomings will be properly addressed as we continue the project. The HI project has appeared void of the necessary oversight and management for ensuring that project risks are mitigated. Despite the project being under the fast track process, the review indicated that the project, as of September 2021, was nine months behind schedule with only 10% of a projected 40% completion realized. Mr. Speaker, with only one year into the project, the cost overruns from the foundation and shell package of the project are 43.8 million. My government remains committed to the, re the redevelopment and completion of the UNO International Airport. <coughs> but we'll do so in an organized and responsible manner. In much the same way that those who flagrantly wasted the taxpayers' money on the St. Jude Hospital will have to account, so too will those who did the same on the Iwanora International Redevelopment Project. 
Mr. Speaker, it would be remiss of me if I didn't inform through you the people of the country, and in particular the people of the South, of the state of the St. Jude Hospital reconstruction project. Mr. Speaker, between the year 2010, the commencement of the St. Jude Hospital reconstruction project, and August 2016, a sum of EC 98 million was spent, with an additional 50 million projected to complete and commission a fully furnished and equipped St. Jude Hospital at a cost of EC 148 million. In September 2026, the UWP stopped construction of the hospital and demolished two of the newly constructed In September 2016, the UWP stopped construction of the hospital and demolished two of the newly constructed buildings, two of the new, demolished two of the newly constructed buildings, which cost approximately $7 million EC. The then UWP government decided to construct a new structure, and according to a report from the government executing agency, the Ministry of Economic Development, as of July 2021, EC $118 million was spent on this new facility. Mr. Speaker, interestingly, a few weeks ago, an official document surfaced from the Attorney General's office, dated 15 July 2021, 11 days before the general elections, called the Revised Draft Finance Agreement of the Central Hospital Reconstruction Project. In the sum of 70.75 million for the continuation of works at St. Jude, including a finance cost of 6.6 .6 million to be settled within one year for the following works architectural work, transition costs to bring the ground floor into use. It is to be noted that the scope of work made no provision for furniture, fixtures, and equipment for the hospital. Mr. Speaker, on the strength of these figures, it would mean that to complete only the ground floor of the St. Jude Hospital without fixtures and equipment would cost the taxpayers of St. Lucia the shocking sum of $188 million for an incomplete hospital with only the ground floor, $40 million more than the projected cost of the initial St. Jude reconstruction project, which was started in 2020. Those involved in this fragrant waste of public funds must account to the people of St. Lucia. <laughs> Meanwhile, I want to assure the people of St. Lucia that work will commence this year to complete the St. Jude Hospital and have it commissioned within a reasonable time. <clears throat> this year, Mr. Speaker, an allocation has been made of EC 1.5 million for remedial works to alleviate the less than desirable conditions at the St. Jude Hospital Stadium location. I once more wish to extend my appreciation and support to the staff of St. Jude Hospital. Mr. Speaker, we are a responsible government, and in this estimate, an allocation has been made to meet the government's, the former government's financial obligations on St. Jude. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, Castries has a rich, vibrant culture and heritage with acclaimed landmarks such as the Cathedral of the Market Conception, built in 1897, and the largest, the largest church in the Eastern Caribbean, the Castries Market, voted Food in the World for Food Markets by National Geographic, the Derek Walcott Square, and a unique enclosed harbor. However, to paraphrase our laureate, at certain times of the day, the city is dead as nails. Mr. Speaker, we intend to rebuild the city with love. Consequently, we are going to pursue a number of in, in, 
interventions to make St. Lucia's capital a vibrant, resilient, and smart heritage city that is socially inclusive and provides accessible recreational space for residents and visitors. This will bring St. Lucia one step closer to accomplishing Sustainable Development Goal 11.7, which is the provision of universal access to safe, inclusive, accessible, and green public spaces. Mr. Speaker, we intend to create similar spaces in several communities around the island. In the not too distant future, we shall revisit the Derek Walcott project on Grass Street to add some vibrancy to the city. Mr. Speaker, in addressing the Jamaican, the Jamaica Stock Exchange earlier this year, I made the point that digital transformation has leveled the playing field in the world of competitive business within countries and between countries, small and large. In today's knowledge-based economy, talent and creativity are the, pres are the preserve of any country or social class of people, end of quote. It is for this reason my government has readily embraced the Caribbean Digital Transformation Project, which aims to build the region's comparative advantage while overcoming its small size and vulnerabilities as the key theme for reducing poverty and increasing shared prosperity. The project has the following priority areas, building resilience to external shocks, strength enhancing the country's human capital, embracing new technologies, and strengthening regional integration. An amount of 6.9 million has been allocated in this financial year for this project. In St. Lucia, two main government-led initiatives have been driving the acceleration of the digital transformation of the economy, the Digital Government Services Platform and the Government Island-wide Network. The Digital Government Services Platform, DigiGov, this platform aims to provide a confidential, efficient, and, simplif and simplified one-stop government service aimed at providing 154 different services online across eight ministries for a simple access point. Government Island-wide Network, GINET, this project will continue with the development of the wireless local area network in public areas to enable locals and visitors to have free, low-cost internet. To date, 32 sites and 94 wireless access points have been established. These, in these initiatives will eventually lead to the goal of making Castries a smart city. As part of the government's transformation agenda, the use of DigiGov will be incentivized to encourage its wildest use by residents and non-residents alike, to allow for online secondary and tertiary education, to enable solutions in, in the diaspora, to promote and enhance our tourism project, and to allow investment in government financial instruments. Mr. Speaker, such is the power of the human spirit that the action of one human, one human being, can change a world of over 7 billion people. We must, of necessity, therefore, encourage our people to cross over the threshold of self-doubt and begin the process of self-belief that we are legitimate actors in bringing change to our communities and the wider world. Where extreme poverty being, is being eliminated and the environmental integrity of our planet respected, we must also begin to accept the truth that the human potential of a St. Lucian is no less than any other citizen of the world. So, so Derek Walker and Arthur Lewis, our two Nobel laureates, are shining examples of local talent with global reach and influence, and they are not alone. As a country, we need to keep striving to give our people the best education and, and opportunities to play their part in shaping an evolving world which is more interconnected than ever. For this reason, my government is committed to providing affordable access to the global digital infrastructure, which allows for the sharing of knowledge and access to new business opportunities for our people. At the heart of putting people first, my government will continue to lead the way in digital transformation with the hope that the, that the private sector will follow to make St. Lucia a desirable and sought after place to work, recreate, and live. <clears throat> St. Lucia is a small island developing state, stands out on the world stage as the birthplace of two Nobel laureates. 
as a result of the achievements, coupled with world-class honors bestowed on many other outstanding St. Lucians for their work contribution to science, technology, and arts. St. Lucia is viewed regionally and, interna and internationally as a country of citizens with a tradition of rich intellectual capacity and accomplishments. As a country with limited natural resources, which heavily depends on its human resource for development, we need to leverage our perceived capital and world-class reputation to attract institutions of learning, research, and development in science, technology, and arts, and in particular, in relation to climate change, adaption, and resilience. To this end, my government has commenced discussions with prominent solution academics towards establishing a national academy of science, technology, and arts. We will further commence prelim preliminary works to establish St. Lucia as an innovation hub for startup companies that require an ecosystem to nurture business ideas, conduct research and development, and for the upscaling of business. We should seek to build industries for goods and services around academia and research for the employment of our youth. Mr. Speaker, we expect that 2022 will be a year of homecoming for many St. Lucians living abroad who have not been able to travel due to, due to the pandemic. This government appreciates the contribution remittances sent, remittances sent home have made a significant impact on our economy. I'm mindful that we have a Citizen for Investment program. It is time we have a Diaspora Investment program. We have many generations of St. Lucian descendants who want to be connected to St. Lucia. Our diaspora represents our surest marked presence in the global village. They are our best ambassadors, providing word of mouth testimonials. In 2022, we intend to leverage far more the presence of the diaspora. We'll also consider measures to extend our St. Lucian family to include the children of second generation St. Lucians in the diaspora. This couple with some new opportunities for, for our diaspora investment program will ensure that our diaspora is motivated to explore gainful investment opportunities at home. This government believes that our citizens here in the diaspora must be fully engaged in the development process and the creation of opportunity and wealth. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. The tourism sector continues to be the largest owner of foreign, exchange, of foreign exchange and private sector employment in St. Lucia. Robust growth in stillover visitors is expected to increase in 2023, supported by increase in ELIF from the UK following the return of Virgin Atlantic in December 2021 and Sunwing Airlines weekly non-stop service from Toronto. Tourism arrivals for the year 2021 were 260,927, which was 40 percent more than projected. Arrivals for the first quarter, arrivals for the first quarter, have been very encouraging, with over 80,000 still arrivals, of which 32,110 visitors arrived in March 2022 an increase of 21% on the initial forecast. Increased traffic from the Caribbean market is anticipated with more relaxed protocols, the European of Trinidad and Tobago, and the potential return of mass events such as carnival, particularly in the summer months. Mr. Speaker, we are moving towards a marketing strategy that is focused on St. Lucia's unique topography and culture in our messaging and not leaning too heavily on deep discounting. In this regard, we are not only establishing a, cap a captivated audience base, but also building long-term perceived value for the brand. We are also seeking to review and improve St. Lucia's web presence and utilize social media platforms to improve the saleability of the products. In line with our marketing thrust, We'll undertake carefully executed year-round niche market campaigns 
distributed by social media and digital platforms using research data to direct geographical focus. Since coming to office, we have experienced a heightened interest in tourism projects. However, this interest in some cases has been tempered by investor concerns of unfair treatment by the last administration. Mr. Speaker, my government will be open and transparent in its dealings with all investors and will do what a responsible government would do to attract reputable investors to operate within the principles of good governance and the law. The following investors have committed to invest in tourism projects. Sanders has announced the refurbishment of Sanders Halcyon and Sanders Atop to commence this year at a cost of US $30 million. And I've already secured DCA approvals for, Sanders, for the Sanders Halcyon project, which comprises 10 standalone buildings with 25 rooms and suites. And Mr. Speaker, I have a letter from the, manager, from the CEO of Sanders confirming that development. Dreams, Kazaba Resort, has commenced construction of 96 rooms at the cost of US 25 million. Point Seraphine Marigo Project has recommenced construction of 140 rooms at the cost of US 42 million. Mr. Speaker, I can assure us and Lucians that notwithstanding the challenges of COVID-19 pandemic and the uncertain global economic landscape brought about by the war in, in Ukraine, we can expect substantial construction activity in the tourism sector. Mr. Speaker, many St. Lucians believe that the DSH agreement signed by the UDAP government was a bad agreement for the people of St. Lucia. We are now in discussions with the promoters to ensure the best outcome for the people of St. Lucia. In the area of public development, there will be increased activity on the OECS Regional Tourism Competitiveness Project, ORTCP. The World Bank funded project, which became effective 2017 and was aimed at facilitating the increased movement of tourists, improving selected tourist sites, and strengthening implementation capacity in tourism market development in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Grenada and St. Lucia, will be restructured to respond to the current needs of the tourism industry. The new focus of the ORTCP is to improve selected tourism sites and capacity building to contribute to a sustainable recovery post COVID-19. Um, an amount of 18.77 million is provided in the estimates for 2022 to 2023 under the ORTCP to undertake the improvement works in the following sites. Castries Market Box Park, Grosley Beach Park, Souffre Old Trafford Project, Canaries Maritime Market and Restaurants, Shurzel Craft Center Rehabilitation, Marigo Waterfront Development Phase 1, and Asfair Local Point, and Bakai Beach Park. Mr. Speaker, in keeping with our government's policy that the benefits of tourism should accrue to as many locals as possible, my government will give greater attention to community-based tourism. In March this year, Parliament enacted the Community Tourism Act, which established a legislative and policy framework to facilitate participation in the program. A line of credit of $9 million has been made available by the Caribbean Development Fund and is now available for community tourism through the St. Lucia Development Bank. The Community Development Tourism Project is expected to be launched in May 2022 at a cost of $5.78 million, which has been provided for in the, in the estimates. The Community Tourism Project is intended to improve the quality of life of St. Lucians by optimizing local economic benefits. The aim is to grow the number of locally owned authentic tourism products and services and to provide opportunities for increased tourist spending in the local economy. Additionally, to enhance and diversify St. Lucia's tourism product, the intended beneficiaries of the Community Tourism Project comprise the following. Communities, spurring economic activities in urban and rural communities of St. Lucia, micro, small and medium enterprises, 
creating increased opportunities for owners of MSMEs, other sectors, providing new and expanded opportunities for other sectors such as agriculture, creative and, creative and manufacturing. And for the country, increasing St. Lucia's online visitor experience and expenditure, thus leading to greater foreign exchange earnings. Mr. Speaker, beyond the enchanting physical beauty of our country, is the equally enchanting creativity of our people. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia has a rich culture which needs to be promoted and preserved, and we must continue to find ways to integrate its uniqueness within our tourism project. In this year's estimates, an amount of 0 0.5 million has been allocated for the creative industry and 3 million for carnival. The craft sector has been identified as a sector with high export potential. Export St. Lucia is currently in the process of content development to create a digital profile for the Schurzel Craft Association, as well as an online catalog and an e-commerce platform for a major online retailer. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Tourism has initiated a project to support the existing crafters with the development of the production spaces of selected craft crafters and a central marketplace to be framed as a heritage tourism destination for visitors using funds from the OECS Regional Tourism Project, or RTCP. The Schrozel, the Schrozel Craft Center's main building will be rehabilitated with the intention of transforming the space into a fully functional retail gallery for the crafters. Once completed, the Ministry of Tourism and the Lucia Tourism Authority will market the Schrozel Center as a heritage touring destination for cruise visitors and land stay visitors. Mr. Speaker, the Library Market and Square project is expected to significantly improve the lives of vendors and patrons of the market with the construction of an aesthetically pleasing covered vending space in the village of Labri. This will be done by replacing the existing market square with new infrastructure. We'll also see the addition of a restaurant which is expected to supplement the existing dining and food culture of the village. It's anticipated that the rehabilitation of the square, the village park, will seek to improve the streetscape of Gaiolaidi Street and allow visitors and villagers to have a new area for community interaction. An amount of EC $1 million has been allocated and earmarked for the commencement of this project. Mr. Speaker, when the St. Lucia Labour Party administration launched the CIP in 2016, it did so with a clear vision to attract investment and to generate revenue for developmental projects. However, since July 2021, we have had to amend the program. This meant rebuilding bridges with established partners who were banished by the previous administration. As a consequence of the changes, we are already witnessing a significant increase in receipts on the program. During the last financial year, 2021-2022, CIP receipts were $102.8 million, compared to $70 million for the year 2020-2021. From initial estimates, we expect an increase in receipts for the financial year 2022-2023. Despite the tangible benefits of the program to the solution economy, challenges have recently emerged that pose significant risk to the future of the program. The push by the OECD countries to undermine the program has gained momentum in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This also includes a move by the U.S. Congress seeking to direct the U.S. government to cooperate with the U.K. and the EU to eliminate the Schengen area visa-free travel for countries that sell passports. Mr. Speaker, this essentially means that the attractiveness of, Saint Lucia, of the St. Lucian passport in allowing visa-free entry to 146 countries will be seriously diminished. Notwithstanding the pressures emanating from the OECD countries, my government is committed to the continuation of the program with the highest level of transparency and integrity. Mr. Speaker, I now come to a sector that is at the heart of our survival as a people. The agriculture sector remains strategically important to the economy of St. Lucia 
because of employment opportunities and the need for food and nutrition security and increased export earnings. Mr. Speaker, one of the consequences of the disruption of the supply chain globally has been food insecurity and rising price of imported food. No society is safe, strong, and resilient without a viable agricultural base, no matter how industrialized the economy is. The pandemic and wars around the world has taught us that the bottom line of every civilization is the ability to, to feed, clothe, and educate itself. The urgency of this task has been made even more pressing by the war in Ukraine and its direct effect on major global food staples such as the wheat, wheat supply. What then, Mr. Speaker, is the importance of food security to our country? It's about guaranteeing access to food at affordable prices to everyone, ensuring that regardless of the circumstance of poverty, the most vulnerable, the elderly, and our children benefit from adequate nutrition. It's about identifying niche markets within which we can comfortably function so that our farmers and producers can find prosperity in their livelihoods. Mr. Speaker, the government remains committed to revitalizing this sector. Seven crops have been identified to enhance agriculture diversification, reduce food imports, and enhance food security. It's expected that more crops will, identif will be identified as a diversification program unfolds. In this regard, the Agriculture and Fisheries Incentives Bill has been revised to facilitate greater market access to a wider range of farmers and fishers. Paradoxically, Mr. Speaker, despite high levels of unemployment in rural areas, many farmers continue to experience shortages in farm labor, in farm labor. It's against this background that the government is supporting the implementation of initiatives that will allow farmers to benefit from seed fertilizer technology and modern mechanization to increase crop production. <clears throat> modern equipment will be procured and many and made available to farmers to enhance their capacity for land preparation. Mr. Speaker, as it relates to securing markets for local food production, we are in the process of repositioning the St. Lucia Marketing Board to better serve the farmers and the consuming public of St. Lucia. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this year, the government will give greater emphasis to agricultural financing and credit risk mitigation. We will encourage and support farmers by incentivizing the use of water storage tanks and the building of wells and ponds. Mr. Speaker, the St. Lucia Labour Party in its 2021 manifesto promised to make the necessary interventions to bring stability back to banana farmers and their families by undertaking to do the following. One, set up a task force immediately with files and supermarkets with a view to re-establish a marketing presence for bananas and other crop producers. Two, to seek to explore regional markets for our bananas. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to announce that we have made great strides and bearing any natural disasters, we are poised for a new beginning in bananas. The task, the task force has developed a strategy and action plan for restructuring the industry, strengthening the NFTO, and developing a strategy for increasing UK market access and regional markets. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to inform this Honourable House that the $4 million guarantee promise, promise, but not honored, and executed by the last administration, has now been honored by this administration and is being used by the NFTO for a strategic partnership among the Ministry of Agriculture, the St. Lucia Development Bank, NFTO and the National Economic Fund. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to report that exports to regional markets have increased while we, we prepare to resume exports to the UK market. Mr. Speaker, history has shown us that if we had added more value to primary products of bananas, we would have fared much better. Mr. Speaker, 
I'm pleased that in spite of the ridicule promoted by the other side, when I ask for more consumption of bananas, I am pleased that many organizations, including the Anglican Church, understood the importance of real agriculture and diversification. And sought not only to inform, but to share practical ways of adding value to our bananas. I am sure that this initiative will continue, and not too long from now, our island will make maximum use of bananas and its byproducts. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the, level, the development of an apiary or bee cultivation sector has been identified as a means of improving lives and livelihoods with opportunities for creating many value-added products. The Bee City project is geared towards increasing local honey production with significant prospects for exporters. The project aims to train and have, and have certified 45 beekeepers under the national standard for beekeeping. This project is being developed in conjunction with the Ministry of Agriculture and the St. Lucia Bureau of Standards. And the St. Lucia Bureau of Standards. To be successful, Mr. Speaker, there are certain challenges in this program that need to be overcome. For example, access to lands for hive placement and financial support for packaging and labeling. This year, the government, with the support of non-governmental organizations like Jeff, will work towards the expansion of the sector. Mr. Speaker, Expo Solutions Lucia has identified CMOS as a commodity with high export potential. CMOS exports from St. Lucia have increased by more than 11,000%. CMOS exports. This year, work will con commence with Export St. Lucia to formulate an export development support program for the industry. It will include institutional strengthening, increases in research and development, production of more valuable products, value-added products, like gel, soaps, etc. Major marketing and promotional support, especially in the USC, will also be conducted to increase exports. Livestock. Livestock development was hampered by the last government's dismantling of the Boshe Zoo meat processing plants and the displacement of cattle farmers in the South. <clears throat> the ability to add value to livestock products was greatly restricted by the decommissioning of the over $20 million Borsezu meat processing plants. This year, my government will continue work on the relocation of the meat processing plant to Voli. In our, diversification, in our diversification drive, cocoa has been identified as another of the commodities with significant export potential for St. Lucia. The continued development of a viable and thriving cocoa industry will create employment opportunities and enhance livelihoods in rural communities. During this financial year, we have budgeted an amount of 1.4 million in support of the continued development of the cocoa industry. The fisheries sector has been severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and the unplanned closure of the fish marketing corporation. Fisher folk are still unable to sell their produce to a central marketing agency facilitating cashews because of the failure of the past government to honor its promise to the new operators, leaving fisher folk to other means of selling their produce. This financial year, the government will seek to rationalize operations at the fishing complex in Castries and will implement repairs to the fishing complex in Denry and Viewfort. <laughs> government still intends to honor the removal of the additional 150 tax on fuel for fisher folk when market conditions permit. 
This year, fishers will benefit from concessions available under the Agricultural and Fisheries Incentives Bill. Mr. Speaker, while we try to protect the sustenance of our people, our physical environment remains under constant threat and destruction, and therefore we need to remain vigilant in protecting it. St. Lucia continues to actively contribute to processes and forums that deliver on significant decisions for the implementation of actions that will ensure a resilient future. Climate change is touted to be the number one threat to sustainable development. The recent IPCC 6 assessment report indicates that human-induced climate change, including more frequent and intense extreme events, has caused widespread adverse impacts and related loss and damage to nature and people beyond natural climate variability. The rise in weather and climate extremes has led to some irreversible impacts as natural and human systems are pushed beyond the ability to adapt. The, re the reality is that it is now widely accepted that climate change is not the only threat to our survival. Climate hazards will occur simultaneously and multiple climatic and non-climatic risks will interact, resulting in compounding overall risks across sectors and regions. The non Non-climatic impacts include nature loss and pollution when combined with climate change compound the triple planetary crisis that we are facing globally. If we are to pursue meaningful and strategic development, we must integrate environmental concerns such as biodiversity, ecosystems management, and climate action into a national economic and developmental agenda. Building resilience requires collaboration across all sectors of our economy. And certainly, this is a lesson taught to us by COVID-19 pandemic, as we saw where the fall of one sector created a domino effect that resounded around the island. The development and endorsement of a number of climate change-related policies and plans have fostered the much-needed cross-sectoral collaboration for pursuing strategic interventions across sectors such as water, agriculture, fisheries, resilient ecosystems, infrastructure, tourism, education and health, as well as energy and transport. We have seen the demonstration of technical and financial support to St. Lucia from development and funding partners as we continue to mainstream resilience building across government and non-governmental agencies, private sector entities and community-based organizations. Building resilience against the impacts of climate change takes on a multi-pronged approach for us in St. Lucia, as we recognize and advocate for a balanced approach in implementing adaptation and mitigation efforts. This has resulted in the execution of projects which, while they are generally climate change focused, have seen the incorporation of livelihood opportunities, especially within and for the benefit of our rural communities. For example, we have improved the preservation of our ecosystem, such as our forests, by rehabilitating degraded areas for the planting of forests and fruit trees, thus increasing our forest cover. <clears throat> the importance of our forests is articulated in our updated 2020 nationally determined contribution as it helps in absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, reducing gas emissions, thus allowing us to play our part, no matter how small, in reducing global warming and ultimately the effects of climate change. Also equally important for this effort is the liberation of income during the recently concluded financial year for over 100 laborers who were involved in the, in the planting exercises within their communities. This only further culti cultivated our forests and generated income, but built ownership of our resources. Our resources, which are crucial for our survival and resilience building, must be protected at all costs. Through joint projects focusing on the Northeast and Southeast regions, the government of St. Lucia received over $17 million, which is being utilized for this purpose. Through collaboration for, resist for resilience building, the groundwork is being laid for, for the rollout of sustainable livelihood activities that are ecologically friendly and when economic activities will specifically target women as beneficiaries. The training of at least 80 agro-processors in a business incubator for innovative and sustainable natural resource-based economic activity, promoting the use of renewable energy technology, 
consistent with the intentions of the nationally determined contribution, which seeks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 7% in the energy sector. Strengthening the water sector by improving water and wastewater management through innovative solutions. Identifying responsible tourism opportunities that promote sustainable livelihoods in Southeast communities. Developing, in developing enhancing agro-processing activities. Using renewable energy technology and modern equipment in the Southeast. And building, and building resilience for adaptation to climate change and climate variability in agriculture in St. Lucia for a multi-million dollar adaptation fund project which intervenes with interventions for water security, soil conservation and management, establishment of green agro parks utilizing solar energy and knowledge management and capacity building. With these initiatives, we can see other sectors such as energy, tourism, and agriculture positively impacting and contributing to how we fight climate change. Further support which focuses on climate change, biodiversity, biodiversity and land degradation will allow St. Lucia to implement underground actions that will not only benefit nature but directly impact local lives and livelihoods, particularly in the post-COVID recovery era. In this regard, St. Lucia can look forward to increased funding support from the Global Environmental Facility, Jeff, on its eighth replenishment cycle made possible for recently concluded negotiations that saw the pledging of funding support to SIDS and LDCs at a minimum of US $8 million per country over the next four years, ending in 2026. It is worth noting that previous replenishment cycles were capped at US $4 million per country. Building resilience and, and adapting to climate change is a full-time effort which requires the dedication of resources of all kinds. I am sure that the Office of the, of the Development of Sustainable Development will tell you it's about building, resi building resilience, one person, one household, one enterprise, one community, one sector at a time. Mr. Speaker, the government is committed as part of its international obligations to explore viable, alt viable alternative sources of energy to supplement our use of fossil fuels. The Renewable Energy Sector Development Project is expected to lead the way in the creation of an enabling environment to scale up renewable energy investments in the private sector and to advise government on the viability of geothermal energy as a resource for power generation. The World Bank has approved a financing package of approximately US $21.9 million for the project, which will be implemented over four years, 2022 to 2026. Under this project, geothermal exploration expected to take place in Belle Plaine, Fonse Jacques, Souffre, and Monliza in Saltibus. The objective of the project is to assess and confirm the viability of an estimated 30 megawatt geothermal power plant. And if proven viable, the government will enter purchase power agreement with Lucilec. This should also help increase the competitiveness of St. Lucia as a low cost energy country. In this fiscal year, in this fiscal year's estimates, EC 14.64 million has been provided for this project, funded by a grant of EC 2.47 million from the, from the Clean Technology Fund, EC 5.96 million from the Foreign Economic Development Office, a loan of 2.67 million from the International Development Agency, IDA, and EC 1.39 million from the Canadian Clean Energy and Forest Climate Change Facility Fund. Mr. Speaker, you may recall that in 2016, the CDB approved a street lighting program with a grant and a loan component, component to replace high energy sodium lights with 25,000 light emitting diode LED lights to help reduce energy consumption island wide. The former government canceled the loan and suspended the project. The former government canceled the loan and suspended the project. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that the government has reinstated the project with the support of a guarantee from the World Bank to a private firm 
and it's expected that the project will last between 12 and 14 months and be will be repaid from lighting cost savings. The project should complement the installation of CCTV cameras for the effective monitoring of our streets by law enforcement agencies. Mr. Speaker, as a country surrounded by water, patch and krill, the Caribbean Sea and part turbulent, the Atlantic and the part turbulent, the Atlantic Ocean, we need to make greater use of the feature by capitalizing on the opportunities the blue economy offers. Thus, we shall build and support our economic recovery and resilience by strengthening the sustainability and competitiveness of two critical and interconnected sectors, tourism and fisheries, and expanding our infrastructure for waste management. The value and importance of this outlook are supported by the World Bank, which has agreed to fund a new program termed Unleashing the Blue Economy of the Caribbean, UBEC. This program will also be funded in Grenada and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This program will achieve its objectives by strengthening regional and national policies and institutional frameworks to bring back business and attract new investments, scaling up innovative financing mechanisms aimed at enhancing employment and productivity in the tourism, fisheries, and waste management value chains for the establishment of a regional MSME matching grant program and a regional climate risk fisheries insurance, supporting investments in, coast, in coastal infrastructure to de risk and leverage private investment in blue economy activities and strengthen climate resilience, and adopting a contingency emergency response mechanism to respond to future extreme weather events. Some of the challenges we face are regional in nature, and addressing them requires interventions at both regional and national levels. Therefore, coordinating actions among the participating countries is critical to maximize synergies given our common dependence on tourism, our shared marine ecosystems and fishery resources, and our shared goal of reducing marine pollution. The successful, implement, the successful implementation of this program will continue the process of diversifying and transforming our economy. Mr. Speaker, my government organizes a sterling work being done by the Global, Global Environmental Facility Small Grants Program, GEF SGD, or GEF, in addressing issues of poverty reduction, climate change mitigation and adaptation, gender equality, and capacity building in communities across St. Lucia. As a committed and impactful agency, my government will strengthen efforts to work more closely with Jeff in pursuing our shared objectives. Mr. Speaker, housing has been identified as a catalyst for economic growth and generation of employment. Mr. Speaker, the government aims to provide accessible, affordable housing solutions for the people of St. Lucia. As we speak, a house repair program aimed initially at the elderly, differently able, and low income is being implemented. Mr. Speaker, during this year, the government will promote investment in private and public sectors in, afford in affordable housing. The National Sites and Services Program will provide service lots to, to provide opportunities for property ownership. Mr. Speaker, it is expected that new lots will, will be provided in different parts of the island, like PI, Labri, Lafag, Shozel, and Miko. Mr. Speaker, in West St. Lucia, is also expected to provide residential lots for low-income individuals in the south of the country. Mr. Speaker, it is expected that in the coming year, more than 150 service lots will be provided island-wide, an amount of EC 4.05 million has been provided in the estimates for the, for the funding of the National Sites and Services Program. Mr. Speaker, this year, we'll revitalize and intensify the program of Unplanned Development, PROUD, an initiative of the Labour Party government since 1997. Phase three of the PROUD targets the regularization of six unplanned settlements in Rockall, in Olion, in Epica, in Cantonment, in Bruceville, and Pom in Oji. 
it's expected that 1,449 households will benefit from that program. An amount of EC 6.62 million from local revenue is provided in estimates for prod free. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, Invest in Lucia is also expected to be involved in the land rationalization in the south of the country. Mr. Speaker, it's my government's policy to ensure participation and inclusiveness within a robust, people-centered functioning society. In this regard, we will review the Local Authorities Act to ensure transparent, accountable, and sustainable local governance in St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, the St. Lucia Labour Party believes that education has a right and not a privilege and a means to unlocking the full human potential of every citizen for the good of the citizen and the community. Mr. Speaker, we believe that information communication technology, ICT, is an essential part of our educational infrastructure. This has made even more, even, this has made even clearer during the COVID-19 pandemic. During our term in government from 2011 to 2016, we initiated the One Laptop Per Child program, which was abruptly stopped by the UWP administration. I am pleased to report that we have reinstated the program. And have this and have distributed over 12,000 devices to students. This is in keeping with our promise of one laptop per child program. Mr. Speaker, we promise to pay greater emphasis on technical and vocational education and training to give our students technical competencies and employable skills. Mr. Speaker, the Human Capital Resilience and the 11th EDF Generation of Employment for Private Sector Development Projects will enable a more harmonized and structured approach to creating an enabling TVET environment. During this financial year, we'll witness the commissioning of two workforce development centers, one in Viewfort to help transition of young people into the world of work and the other in, in the other to be identified in the months ahead. Mr. Speaker, the project will also establish training for National Caribbean Vocational Certification to formalize the skills and competencies to allow students to compete in the local <coughs> and regional markets. In keeping with our pledge of education for all, we will broaden primary school education to address critical thinking, effective communication, problem solving, global thinking, conflict re re resolution, and emotional intelligence. We have already made it easier. We have already made it easier for low-income parents by paying facility fees for all primary schools. We will, in we will introduce African and St. Lucian heritage at the primary schools, and we will broaden the curriculum to incorporate the development of TVET skills, including the teaching of civics. At the primary level, we will sensitize people to the value of agriculture and food and nutrition security. A small allocation has been allocated in the budget for, to promote kitchen gardens in schools. Mr. Speaker, we hope, to, we hope to nurture a responsible, agile, and community-minded citizen who will be ready to transition into the secondary school system. Mr. Speaker, the children in this country should be exposed to a modern and accessible secondary education, where independent and self-directed learning is free of institutional financial impediments. In this regard, we will continue to pay facility fees for all secondary school students and will absorb the cost of CXC examination fees for English and Mathematics for Form 5 students. It is my government's intention, it is my government's intention, before the end of this term, barring any further financial crises, 
to pay CXC fees for students sitting at least five CXC subjects. This year, this year, we will establish smart classrooms and a virtual learning environment in secondary schools. Mr. St. Lu Mr. Speaker, the St. Lucia Labour Party believes that in every St. Lucian household, there should be at least one university graduate. In this regard, we shall provide tax relief to business places that assist employees pursuing education courses, and we will continue improvement in online learning with a focus on territory education. We will continue to encourage the Avalon Community College to expand its degree offerings and to consider the viability of converting it into a fully fledged university. <clears throat> the OECS program for educational <coughs> advancement and relevant learning, <coughs> OECS pool, is a transformative four year program designed to achieve expanded access and improve student learning in primary education. The program seeks to maximize a grant from the Global Partnership for Education to the tune of approximately 27 million intended for four Windward Islands with some benefits to the other five, to the other five English speaking OECS countries. With that funding, five early childhood centers will be refurnished in each of the Windward Islands. Hundreds of children in these countries with parents unable to finance their children's education will now enter a school with a strong early foundation. <laughs> Assistive de devices will be purchased to support the learning of students with special needs. The major highlight of this program is a new digital curriculum, which will be developed for primary schools. This curriculum is intended to emphasize programs for student development beyond academics. This program is designed to be flexible so that should there be another major interruption to school as a result, as a result of a pandemic and a natural disaster, schools will be able to continue. <clears throat> another transformative project is the GIGA project, a global in initiative being implemented by the OECS Commission in collaboration with the United Nations Children Emergency Fund, UNICEF, and the International Telecommunications Union, ITU. A major ambition of the GIGA project is to ensure sufficient and sustainable connectivity for all, for all schools in support of learning. The timing of this initiative is crucial as access to digital tools and internet for teaching and learning become more important. Mr. Speaker, I come to the, to the real wealth of the nation, its health. The government will pursue a health policy that is patient-centered, evidence-based, equitable, accessible, and affordable. <clears throat> Over the last two years, government has been battling the containment of the COVID virus. Presently, we seem to be experiencing a general so long in the spread of the pandemic. This should not encourage complacency as new variants continue to emerge while we are not increasing our vaccination uptake. Mr. Speaker, in this financial year, we are continuing to respond to the effects of the pandemic for which an amount of 43.87 million has been budgeted to fund a range of mitigation and control measures. Mr. Speaker, we promise that we will implement universal health care within the first term of our government. In this regard, we are continuing with the World Bank funded health system strengthening project, which seeks to provide a more equitable and efficient health system. Mr. Speaker, in this financial year, our government will commence the process of implementation of universal health care. The initial health services provided under 
you under our UHC have been identified and will include diabetes, hypertension, maternal health, dialysis, and early cancer diagnosis. The World Bank funded health system strengthening project will lend support to the UHC by efficiency in the use of health expenditure through a performance-based scheme. The project will also assist in the structuring of the UHC to provide greater equity, quality, and efficiency in the delivery of care. A universal health care program will be established within the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and Elderly Affairs. This program will commence with an initial fund of $6.46 million, which will be augmented in subsequent years by a funding scheme to be determined. To be determined. The World Bank-funded Health System Strengthening Project will additionally help to strengthen the country's public health preparedness and response given the growing threat posed by new and emerging diseases. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, in the allocation of portfolios, I signaled my intention to pay special attention to the retired and elderly by creating in the Ministry of Health a Department of Elderly Affairs in recognition of one of our of one of our core values, inclusiveness to engage retired, elderly, and vulnerable groups in nation building. In this regard, the development of a national policy for older persons has begun. Mr. Speaker, in the pursuit of, in the pursuit of putting people first, we need to ensure that there are adequate social safety nets that will enable the poorest and differently able citizens to enjoy a decent life in St. Lucia. This is why we intend to increase and reform our assistance program. Notwithstanding our ranking in the Human Development Index, poverty remains high and has been worsened by the ongoing negative COVID-19 pandemic and the effects of global events. It's against this background that the Public Assistance Program, PAP, had to be improved and expanded by the addition of 1,005 households using the St. Lucia National Eligibility Test, SLNET. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my government has insisted, Mr. Speaker, my government has insisted and instructed that beneficiaries of public assistance should be paid at the same time as public servants as a demonstration of respect for the welfare and dignity of the less fortunate. Mr. Speaker, we do not believe that our less fortunate citizens should remain in persistent poverty if it can be avoided. In this regard, a consultancy for the development of a graduation strategy for social assistance programs to guide the transition process from social assistance to independent living will be completed this year. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, not only has the government increased its budgetary allocation to the Ministry of Social Transformation, but has reinstated the distress fund with an allocation of $1 million. Mr. Speaker, the government appreciates the contribution of non-government organizations to, to the social well-being of the less fortunate and has responded accordingly by increasing the subvention to some of these organizations. Mr. Speaker, my government's home care program we started in 2012, has provided much need quality care between the hours of 8 and 4.30 to a number of senior citizens, some of whom are incapacitated, incapacitated because of degenerative diseases and old age. The responsibilities of the caregivers range from administering medication, preparing household chores, and conducting errands on behalf of senior citizens. 
Demand for the services offered by the program has increased substantially since its inception. Mr. Speaker, an evaluation of the home care program was recently undertaken, and some of its findings revealed the need to increase the number of caregivers given the demand for elderly care. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, an amount of seven million has been allocated for the home care program while the government is actually pursuing ways and means of increasing the range and scope of the program. My government continues to encourage and support the development of young people in St. Lucia. In this regard, the Ministry of Youth and Sports will target the most vexed the, we target the most vexing issue of youth unemployment for the St. Lucia Skills app. The Skills application app will create a database of available skills to open employment opportunities and avenues for the, for the gig economy. In this virtual marketplace, potential employers will be able to contact potential and skilled workers within any geographical location. More resources will be provided to the elite and emerging, emerging athletic program for the development of these athletes to become world class. The management and maintenance of sporting facilities are of utmost importance, and the ministry has completed a facilities management policy which will guide the management and maintenance of sporting facilities. In this regard, a provision has been made in the estimates for the maintenance of playing fields and sporting facilities in addition, the Bellevue playing field, among others, will be renovated. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the time has come to give parliamentarians a greater say in deciding projects for the constituency and to make them accountable. Mr. Speaker, an amount of $28.5 million has been allocated towards the constituency development program. Mr. Speaker, the Constituency Development Program is being financed by the Republic of China, by Republic of China Taiwan, and is aimed at allowing elected parliamentarians the opportunity and ability to fund small projects in the, uh, of their choice in their constituency. And Mr. Speaker, I mean all parliamentarians. <laughs> Unfortunately, Unfortunately, in the previous five years, this project was used as a means of disenfranchising opposition parliamentarians. None of the parliamentarians in the opposition at this time received one cent under this program. Mr. Speaker, during this financial year, all parliamentarians, all parliamentarians, and I know my colleagues have an issue. All parliamentarians, unlike in the last five years, unlike in the last five years under the UWP, will be allowed to choose and fund social and infrastructural projects in their constituency in a transparent and accountable manner. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the long-standing issues of termination payments to majestic industries and LIAT 1974 limited workers will be settled. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you may recall about 30 years ago, the owners of Majestic Industries, a garment manufacturing operation at BZ, left St. Lucia owing workers termination payments. My administration will honor the long-standing payment to majestic workers for the issuing of government bonds, which have been accepted by the representative, by the representative of these workers. And Mr. Speaker, this is not new to our, our government. In, you may recall the Bell Fashion workers in Denry, who suffered a similar fate, and the then government relinquished its back pay to pay the workers at Bell Fashion. You may wish to note that this is a, another commitment made by the former Prime Minister.
which remain unsettled and left now for this administration to honor. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the government, the government has, and has entered into a similar arrangement with the non-management LIAT workers who were terminated by the closure of the company in 2020. We are currently in discussions with the former management staff, including the pilots, to arrive at an acceptable settlement. Mr. Speaker, our, dec our decision to settle these outstanding payments is yet another demonstration of our, of our continued commitment to the upliftment and welfare of the workers of St. Lucia. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, over the years, access to adequate capital has been a major hindrance to the growth and development of micro, small, and medium-sized businesses. This has worsened since the onset of COVID-19 pandemic and has exposed these businesses to a higher risk of failure. In recognition of this challenge, Mr. Speaker, my government has agreed to assist these businesses in getting on their feet by providing working capital support. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to announce, consistent with our promise in our election manifesto to small business owners, that the government will provide much needed financial support across all sectors of the economy to the micro, small, and medium-sized businesses in the form of soft loans, grants, and technical assistance. The MSME Soft Loan and Grant Program will advance the government's priorities in the areas of generating economic growth, business expansion, sustainability and diversification, employment creation, and uplifting the quality of life of St. Lucians. This initiative is targeted to reach 849 registered medium and small micro-enterprises, including women and young persons, and will provide at least 1,698 new jobs. The MSNE Soft Loan and Grant Program will be implemented by the Department of Commerce through the Solution Development Bank. A total of EC 10 million has been allocated in this year's estimates for that purpose. The Minister of Commerce will please provide further details about that program. In addition, <coughs> further support has been made available to the SMEs in the form of loan, of loan guarantees for loans secured from the four institutions, Bank of St. Lucia, SLDB, SLDB, and First National Bank. These guarantees have been provided for the Eastern Caribbean Partial Credit Guarantee Corporation. SMEs are encouraged to make use of this facility for the purchase of inventory, equipment, and the provision of working capital. Assistance is also available to SMEs involved in manufacturing and seeking export markets in the form of certification provided by Export St. Lucia's certification program. The government of St. Lucia supports the proposed extension of the OECS MSME guarantee facility projected OS, OECS MSME guarantee facility project recommended by the World Bank with Export St. Lucia being the executing agency. In preparing our citizens for participation in a wider economic space, upskilling will become necessary. In this regard, the Vocational Skills Training Program was started in February 2022 and was conducted by the Sir Alphonse College will focus on four specialized areas, health aid, hospitality, digital and creative entrepreneurship, and early childhood development. This program is being financed Training, this program is being financed by the Republic of China, Taiwan. <coughs> Training in each area will be undertaken in a three-month cycle to run concurrently. Tuition for, tuition for, particip for participants will be fully funded and participants will be provided with a stipend for full attendance. Participants who successfully complete the program will receive certification from the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Mr. Speaker, my government is aware 
that women operating in small businesses are underperforming when compared to their male counterparts. We therefore encourage women entrepreneurs to work more closely with Export Lucia so that, so that they can secure the necessary, necessary assistance to enhance their businesses. Mr. Speaker, my government promised in its manifesto to, one, expunge the records of crimes relating to the possession of small quantities of cannabis. Two, decriminalize the use of marijuana to be followed by its eventual legalization. Three, provide the necessary resources to create and maintain a sustainable and vibrant market for cannabis regionally and internationally. And four, allow cultiva cultivation, cultivation of four plants of marijuana for personal and private use. We have, to a large extent, delivered promises one, two, and four. Mr. Speaker, I have already apologized to the Rastafarian community for the historical atrocities meted out to them for the consumption and religious use of cannabis. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, these injustices will be reversed when the appropriate structure is set for the commercialization of marijuana. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the government has formed a stakeholder committee that comprises representatives of the police, members of the Rastafarian community, and advocates of the legalization and other sectoral interests to develop an appropriate legislative framework for cannabis commercialization. Mr. Speaker, we do not intend to in reinvent the wheel and will be learning from our fellow neighboring countries who have, who have commercial cannabis for exports. Mr. Speaker, we, export within, we expect within a reasonable time to export cannabis like our neighboring islands. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the protection of our heritage and patrimony is essential if we are to preserve our uniqueness as a people. As a government, we have a responsibility to encourage and support all institutions involved in the protection of our patrimony. The treatment of the National Trust by the last administration was a clear demonstration of disrespect for the people of St. Lucia and the things that make us St. Lucia. It is for this reason that upon coming into government, we spent little time in correcting this act of disrespect by reinstating the annual submission to the National Trust in the amount of $700 million. While we welcome visitors to enjoy our public spaces and beaches, it should never be at the exclusion of citizens who live here. This is why we will ensure that every citizen has free access to all public beaches, a right which will be enshrined in appropriate legislation. Mr. Speaker, as an independent country, we are determined to provide greater access and affordability to justice for our people. I am pleased to report that work has begun in the preparation of our ascension to the appellate jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice, which will make St. Lucia the fifth CARICOM member state to replace the Privy Council. Mr. Speaker, a committee chaired by a learned judge has been tasked to assist in that process, which will include the preparation of the legislative amendment of the St. Lucia Constitution to a Lord for ascension to the CCG. The government intends to ignite the discourse on constitutional reform, to seek consensus on specific recommendations 
for changes in the Constitution. To achieve some movement on this important national matter, the government has engaged a consultant to review the findings and recommendations of the Constitutional Reform Commission report. Two, to review the outcome and recommendations from the parliamentary resolution on the Constitutional Reform Commission report. And three, to advise on the requirements for the implementation of the recommendations of the Constitutional Reform Commission report. And four, to identify various provisions of the Constitution and or other legis legislation that would require amending as part of the Constitutional Reform agenda. Funding is provided in the estimates of expenditure for these activities. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> citizen safety and security is at the core of the nation's prosperity. Over the recent past, with escalating levels of violence and murders, our security institutions have been challenged and public confidence and trust in them diminished. My government is adopting a systematic approach to rebuilding confidence in our security apparatus and citizen safety. The success of that approach will be achieved for the use of established law enforcement channels, as well as through citizen participation, use of innovative techniques, techniques and technologies for information gathering and intelligence-based policing. In our efforts to improve operational efficiency, one of the measures which shall be undertaken after the demolition of the custody suites by the last government, one of the measures which shall be taken is the re-establishment of a central holding cell for prisoners in castries. We shall rehabilitate one of the old buildings at the former headquarters site on Upper Beach Street to temporarily house detainees. We'll also continue with the rehabilitation and repairs of the various police stations island-wide. Among these are the Viewfort Police Station and the construction of divisional headquarters in Grosjele, which I spoke of earlier. Repairs to the bodily correctional facility will include the securing of fencing, replacement of locks, and other general repairs. IT equipment will be, will be procured and training will return for the police. And a sum of 1.2 million has been earmarked for the purchase of police vehicles. Plans are afoot for the construction of new police headquarters. Mr. Speaker, as we relate to our court system, there is an urgent need to address the backlog of cases in the courts. This backlog has been due partly to the COVID pandemic and inadequate provision of resources. The SWIFT Justice Project, for which a sum of 2.7 million has been approved in the estimates, will be geared towards reducing the backlog of criminal cases by increasing technical and administrative support to the criminal high courts. This project is expected to reduce the processing time of cases to two years. Mr. Speaker, while we try to address the issue of crime, we must not forget that it's a consequence of a breakdown in our society where the value of family is being undermined by inadequate social support. We therefore will continue to take a holistic approach to address the issues of crime reduction and prevention. Mr. Speaker, in the run-up to the last general elections, my party committed to ushering in a new era of good governments with zero tolerance for corruption in the administrative of public affairs. Mr. Speaker, quite apart from our core beliefs, our policy, our policy position was in response to an outcry for justice from the people for the abuses which were committed by the last UWP administration. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia has witnessed a massive decline in its corruption index global rating. Therefore, we promise to stop the slide and restore our country's reputation to good international standings. Mr. Speaker, good governance 
protects the citizens of a country from abusive administrations who use state resources for the benefit of a few at the expense of the majority. It ensures that the government is accountable, transparent, equitable, and inclusive and law-abiding. We cannot allow corruption to take deep root in the administration of government affairs and its statutory agencies. We know that corruption breeds inefficiency, illegal appropriation of wealth, wastage of resources, and disregards the interests and needs of the most vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, we are reviewing the Integrity in Public Life Act to strengthen this legislation and to hold public officials accountable for the actions. Additionally, we are in the advanced stage of preparation and enacting the relevant legislation to appoint a special prosecutor. <laughs> to conduct investigations into acts of alleged public corruption. And there is an allowance in the estimate for that purpose. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, in our manifesto for the 2021 elections, we declared that economic diplomacy will be at the forefront of our foreign policy agenda. St. Lucia's foreign policy will therefore be one that pursues an economic and developmental agenda by intensifying relationships with old friends and non-traditional allies and reorienting of the diplomatic service machinery. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to focus on regional integration in our relations with the Caribbean. In particular, we, are, we will work towards the strengthening of our harmonization of foreign policy at the level of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS, and the Caribbean Community, CARICOM, in negotiations with, with regions on critical international issues such as climate change, international trade, and other international issues affecting the core of the Caribbean as a whole. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to strengthen our relationship with our traditional allies as we continue to build on our South-South cooperation. In this regard, we call on the speedy resolution of the situation in Venezuela and the removal of the embargo on the people of Cuba in keeping with our policy, in keeping with our policy on non-interference in the internal affairs of foreign countries. Mr. Speaker, we are grateful to the government and people of the Republic of China, Taiwan, who have been dear and sincere friends of the people of St. Lucia. We, we, therefore, we, we therefore wish to reaffirm our diplomatic support to the government of the Republic of China, Taiwan. Mr. Speaker, this and this and Lucia government wishes for speedy resolution of the U Ukraine Russia conflict and stands in the international community in the quest for a speedy and peaceful resolution. Mr. Speaker, securing debt, debt sustainability while achieving high levels of economic growth that supports economic transfer, transformation has been identified as a means to reduce unemployment and improve the quality of life of our citizens. In this budget, in this budget we have crafted a set of realistic policies that will provide relief for the public and private sectors battered by the effects of the pandemic and now the Russia-Ukraine war. Mr. Speaker, I now come to, the, to those fiscal and economic measures that government proposes to meet that aim. Mr. Speaker, you may recall that the Lucia Labour Party promised to waive the payment of income tax for workers earning up to $4,000 a month or $48,000 annually. Mr. Speaker, having reviewed the fiscal situation and the likelihood of higher interest rates occasioned by changes in the global economic environment brought about by the Ukraine war, my government has decided to defer 
full implementation of this waiver of income tax. As an incremental step towards fulfilling this purpose, my government has decided that effective January 1st, 2023, persons earning up to $2,083 monthly, $25,000 annually, will pay no tax. This, this, will include, this will include public servants in grades 1 to 5. Mr. Speaker, this means that an additional 15,000 people in the public and private sectors will no longer be paying income tax. This measure should provide some relief to these workers battling to cope with higher food prices and the general increase in the cost of living. Mr. Speaker, effective January 1st, 2023, the annual personal income tax allowance will increase from 18,000 to third, will increase from 18,000. Let me say that again. Mr. Speaker, effective 1st January 20, 2023, as I've said before, the first $25,000 of income will have no personal income tax. Deductible allowances, which include home mortgages, interest, insurance, and others, will now be capped at a maximum of $30,000. There will be three personal income tax bans instead of four. Persons earning between up to $15,000, 15%. Between $15,000 and $40,000, 20%, and above $40,000, 40%. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the effect of this change, Mr. Speaker, the effect of this change will result in two-thirds of taxpayers being better off. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the effect of this change will result in two-thirds of taxpayers being better off, bringing the average effective income tax rate down from 5.4 to 3.7%. For example, Mr. Speaker, an employee earning a monthly salary of $5,500 and with annual deductible allowance of $9,074 will enjoy an increase in disposable income of $112.43 under the new personal allowance of $25,000. This increase in disposable income equates to a 2% increase in salary. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we have yet to fully own our commitment to settle refunds up to $5,000. <clears> Mr. Speaker, my government from November 2021 has instructed the inner revenue to refund all taxpayers owed less than $500. This exercise is ongoing. For the period November 21 to March 2022, an amount of EC $3.8 million in tax refunds was paid to 1,959 taxpayers. <coughs> this comprises of zero Value of checks, 0 to 500, 600, out of $175,109. Between 500 and 1,262 people at a cost of 262700 And above 1,997 at a cost of $3.38 million. The grand total of $3.8 million paid between November 2021 to March 2022 to 1,959 taxpayers. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, sitting on the government's books at the inner revenue is 1.2 billion outstanding taxes and interest and penalty charges. Interest and penalty charges amount to 780 million. Given the difficult economic environment, my government 
has decided to encourage the payment of outstanding taxes. <clears throat> for income for income tax years up to for income tax years up to 2020 corporate income tax personal income tax and property tax if paid by may the first 2023 will be exempted from all related interest and penalty charges <laughs> Income tax liabilities, all income tax liabilities, and related interest and penalty charges due before the income tax year 2000 will be written off. This disputes relating to tax liabilities, which have delayed the payment of taxes will be subject to review by a dedicated committee to speed up the process of settlement so that taxes can be paid earlier than later. For the purpose of clarity, the waiver of penalties and interest will not apply to the following taxes. Value-added tax, withholding tax, hotel occupancy tax, and PAYE taxes deducted from employees by employers. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, taxes collected by companies and individuals on behalf of the government of St. Lucia must be handed over in full and paid on time. It is for this reason that no concession was made so as not to risk compromising the need for taxes Collect on, collected on behalf of the government of St. Lucia to be paid in full and on time. However, taxpayers are encouraged to contact the Indian Revenue to agree on workable arrangements to settle outstanding VAT liabilities. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, my government intends to overhaul the tax system to ensure greater efficiency in the collection of taxes to secure a higher level of tax compliance and to broaden the tax base. And overhauling of the tax system will require greater reliance on indirect tax rather than direct tax. In this regard, in this, in this process, the existing tourism and fiscal incentive regimes will be, re will be reviewed to ensure that they are fit for purpose. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we are compliant with international regulations as they relate to international taxation, and to attract the right types of investment, the government of St. Lucia will undertake a comprehensive revision of its tax policies and legislation. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia continues to make strides in meeting international tax transparency standards. In this regard, we have made legislative amendments since assuming office to enhance our monitoring capabilities in relation to the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act factor, the Automatic Exchange of Financial Information Act, and the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development Inclusive Framework on Base Erosion Profit Shifting. Mr. Speaker, it should be noted that compliance is an ongoing process with several facets. As such, continual adjustments are required. The OECD is currently deliberating on implementing a global minimum tax, as well as, as establishing standards for what they consider the fair distribution of taxing rights on the profits of large multinational companies. Mr. Speaker, you may, you may be aware of the increased scrutiny of the Citizens by Investment programs, whereas countries and international institutions have called for the repeal of these programs. As such, there may be need to, re to review our program to ensure that it meets the standards of international tax transparency. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia received an on-track rating from the OECD for the automatic exchange of information in 2021, which is a favorable, a favorable rating and one which signals our firm commitment to compliance with international tax standards. 
Mr. Speaker, as you know, the European Union continues its assessment of jurisdictions to promote fair taxation worldwide and address what it deems to be harmful tax practices. As such, it publishes a list of non-cooperative tax jurisdictions twice a year. St. Lucia is presently in good standing in the EU and not on the EU blacklist. Mr. Speaker, we continue to work diligently on our current ratings with both the EU and OECD while attracting foreign direct investment and fueling sustainable economic growth. Mr. Speaker, the government rec recognizes that there is still some work to be done to ensure that St. Lucia continues to be competitive as an international financial services center. Therefore, the government has embarked upon targeted consultation with the private sector to explore a more broad-based sectoral reform, all aimed at ensuring that St. Lucia remains an attractive domicile for investors. To this end, Mr. Speaker, the government intends to undertake the following additional measures during this fiscal year. A complete overhaul of the legislative regime governing headquarters, headquarters companies. The introduction of new legislation governing, governing international trusts. The introduction of new legislation governing limited partnerships. The introduction of a tax residency program that makes St. Lucia more attractive to high net worth individuals from around the world. Mr. Speaker, the government recognizes that the international financial services sector has an important role to play in helping to grow the economy, economy of St. Lucia. However, we also appreciate for the sector to attain a sustainable level of growth, it will require very robust collaboration between government agencies that are responsible for, responsible for regulating, monitoring, and promoting the sector and the private sector itself. Such partnering is particularly important given the ongoing challenges posed by various agencies such as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, the European Union, and the Financial Action Task Force. <clears throat> this government, Mr. Speaker, is committed to taking all the necessary measures to not only ensure that St. Lucia continues <clears throat> to continues to comply with standards set by these national bodies, but also to maintain the stability and viability of the international financial services sector. As it presents many opportunities <clears throat> for further diversification of our economy. Mr. Speaker, we are aware that to finance capital investments necessary to expand the economy, debt is a reality. <clears throat> While COVID provided access to concessionary loans, the current disruption in the global economic environment brought about by the Ukraine war will result in highest, higher interest rates, making borrowing expensive. Mr. Speaker, we will be frank and honest with the people of St. Lucia on our debt position. Mr. Speaker, the current level of public debt now stands at 90.6% of GDP. That is 4.13 billion. The debt stock includes central government debt, government guaranteed debt, and public sector debt. The preferred route to bringing public debt under control is to generate surpluses on the primary account. In the current circumstances, this is not likely, and therefore, my government's immediate debt policy strategy is to reduce its dependence on short-term high interest borrowing for the use of treasury bills and to pursue longer-term financing with lower interest rates from multinational agencies, financial institutions, and friendly governments. Mr. Speaker, our treasury bill portfolio today is in excess of 420 million, thereby limiting the use of this instrument as a cash, as a cash management tool for which it is intended. Mr. Speaker, over the past five years, we have just been rolling over the treasury bills and essentially treating, treating them as long-term instruments. Mr. Speaker, my government will attempt to address this untenable situation, and as a result, during this fiscal year, we will seek to convert treasury bills into longer-term instruments. Mr. Speaker, con conversion of these short-term instruments 
is in keeping with the government's medium-term debt management strategy to lengthen the maturity profile, reduce rollover risk, and reduce the cost of borrowing by seeking lower interest rates. To assist the government in returning to prudential levels of borrowing, my government intends to enact the Public Debt Management Bill. This new piece of legislation will enable us to manage and consolidate all laws pertaining to debt and to do so with a high level of transparency and accountability. It will also reduce ambiguities and inconsistencies that may have existed in various pieces of legislation. Mr. Speaker, other reforms are necessary if we are to remain on track with debt sustainability. And in, and in this regard, we intend to support the Public Finance Act and procurement legislation with the preparation of appropriate regulations. The proposed regulations are designed to provide the required clarity to certain sections of the Act to make its application more practical for use in government ministries, departments, and agencies. Mr. Speaker, if we had to create an enabling environment to improve and strengthen the ease of doing business, certain legislative changes must be completed. They include the security, the in, the security interest in movable properties bill. The security interest in movable properties bill will allow for the use of, mo of movable assets to secure loan financing. Bankruptcy and insolvency bill. Mr. Speaker, the bankruptcy and insolvency bill will allow debt holders to restructure their debts instead of relying on receivership and insolvency as the only options. Credit reporting, credit reporting bill. The credit reporting bill makes provision for the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank to be a credit bureau regulator within the OECS. We are now in the possession of the report for making final changes to the bill before being presented to Parliament for enactments. Mr. Speaker, in our manifesto, we stated that the Labour Party government will establish a sovereign wealth fund to attract external investment for the development of state assets and the preservation for the long-term benefits of St. Lucians. During this term, we will commence the formulation and design of a mechanism for the establishment of a sovereign wealth fund. Once the framework is established, we will prepare the enable legislation for discussion and its eventual passing into law. Rest assured, Mr. Speaker, the management of the fund will be aimed at serving the best interests of the St. Lucian people and will embody the principles of transparency, accountability, and financial prudence. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> the St. Lucian Development Bank will be required to play a more significant role in facilitating development and low-cost funding to micro, small, and medium-sized businesses, individuals, and other businesses seeking to expand and enhance their businesses. However, to attract necessary funding from international financial institutions for on lending, the bank's level of capitalization needs to be augmented. Therefore, my government will be addressing the undercapitalization of the bank by providing equity capital of $10 million. The bank will also be expected to reposition itself and internal processing to become more responsive to the needs of the country. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, in light of the unforeseen changes in global and domestic circumstances, the COVID-19 and Russian Ukraine war, supply chain disruptions, and the need to ensure consistently with my government's pledge of putting people first, we have been in the process of revising the medium-term development strategy. Mr. Speaker, for many years, this, for many years now, discussions have been held with the Civil Service Association on the policy of traveling allowance for civil servants. My government is aware that the cost of maintenance of vehicles has increased, and therefore the need to revise existing traveling allowances. However, we must keep in, keep in mind the fiscal situation facing our country, made worse by the COVID and the Russian-Ukraine war, in making proposals for revision. In this regard, after discussion and deliberation, the cabinet, the cabinet of ministers 
has agreed to offer traveling officers a $10,000 duty waiver on any vehicle purchased from July 2022 to April 2023. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, going forward, a committee will be formed to provide a comprehensive view of the traveling policy, which will eventually lead to the amendment of that policy. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, government pensioners are unlikely to benefit from the new income tax relief while being subjected to the same pressures of the rising cost of living. My government therefore has decided to make a one-off payment of $500 to all government pensioners in July this year. <clears throat> At a later date, a more comprehensive plan of relief will be made for pensioners. Mr. Speaker, my government has secured concessionary funding from the Republic of China, Taiwan, and others to cushion some of the negative impacts of COVID-19 compounded by the Ukraine-Russia conflict, which has already resulted in higher food and fuel prices. Mr. Speaker, in the event of this, econ of this economic fallout and the economy remains on course, my government will take res a responsible approach to avoid unnecessary spending and wastage a characteristic feature of the last administration by scaling down, by scaling back on drawdowns on these concessionary loans. Mr. Speaker, as I indicated earlier, the policy of my government to, when possible, use concessionary fund finance to fund projects. Mr. Speaker, you will note that for the first time, 80% of our financing needs are programmed from concessionary loans in short of, instead of short-term, higher-cost bonds and treasury-based financing. Mr. Speaker, 48% of these loans are expected to come from the Republic of China, Taiwan, 18.13 million representing outstanding amounts to be disbursed from existing, and 173.69 million from loans to be incurred during this financial year. Mr. Speaker, my government intends to spend 80.73 million on various capital projects outlined and 92.94 million as budgetary support for operations. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, for my, my, for my government to undertake the plans outlined earlier, we must have access to financial resources to meet our developmental needs. Therefore, I propose that the 2022 23 budget be financed as follows. Recurrent revenue, 1.15 billion, comprising of tax revenue of 1.016 billion, non-tax revenue of 133.886 million, capital revenue from proceeds of sale of assets amounting to 10.6 million, grants amounting to 176.68 million from friendly governments. The, as follows, Republic of, of China, Taiwan, 52.62 million, Japanese International Agency, JICA, 10.54 million. UK SIF Partnership Fund, 53.1 million. European Development Fund, 16.5 million. UN Environmental Program, UNEP, 10.6 million. Caribbean Development Bank, 7.7 million. United Arab Emirates, 6.1 million. Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office, 5.9 million. Go Japanese government, 2.9 million. International Labour Organization, 2.5 million. World Bank, either 2.056 million. CARICOM Development Fund, 1.06 million. And other donors, 4.73 million. Mr. Speaker, in addition to 1.327 billion revenues and grants, the net financing needs of the, of the budget amounting to 505 million will be met from the following sources. Government instruments, including bonds and treasury bills, 79.736 million, representing a reduction of 66.9 million, or approximately 161.1 million, compared to approved estimates for 2021-2022. Disbursements from loans totaling 425.38 million, comprising of 57.25 from the Caribbean Development Bank, 3.06 from the Caribbean Development Fund, 
75.4 from the National Development Agency, IDA, 1.91 from the Republic of China on Taiwan, 6.8 from, from IDA, Strategic Climate Fund, 81 million from the World Bank Development Policy Credit, 8.5 million from CDB Inter-American Inter -American Development Bank, and 1.398 million from the Canadian Clean Energy and Forest Climate Facility Fund. Mr. Speaker, it is the policy of this government to leverage our current access to concessionary funding to drive infrastructural works, employment, and social protection. It's for this reason, Mr. Speaker, that for the first time, or for as long as I can remember, eight, over 80% of our needs are programmed to be financed from concessionary loans, with 48% of that financing coming from the Republic of China, Taiwan. I wish to point out that of the 191.82 million to be financed from the Republic of China on Taiwan, 18.13 million represents outstanding amounts to, dis to be disbursed from existing loans, and the balance of 173.69 million in total will be used to finance various projects, amounting to 80.75 million, while 92.94 will be provided for budgetary support for operations. Mr. Speaker, we are being open and transparent. Mr. Speaker, I'm ever mindful of the need to be able, in the interest of fiscal sustainability, to expand on our expansionist program should the need arise. Mr. Speaker, we are open and transparent, unlike our friends on the opposite side. I want to ensure the people of St. Lucia that if circumstance, circumstances dictate we will revisit the budget. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I wish, before I end, I have a few minutes left, but I wish, before I forget, to express my thanks to you, members of the House, the police, for your, for your attention during my address and during the sittings of this House. I wish to express my, my profound gratitude to my cabinet colleagues for the support and contribution to the preparation of this comprehensive policy statement. I wish to thank them, Mr. Speaker. I wish to thank the staff and all the officials, particularly the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Economic Development, and all the other ministries and agencies of government, the staff, the department, secretaries, Mr. Speaker, for their professional and untiring efforts during the budget preparation, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Cabinet Secretary, the advisors, my advisors, and the team at the Office of the Prime Minister, and especially the staff of the National Printing Corporation. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> allow me to summarize some of the measures we have taken to cushion the impact of rising fuel and food prices affecting our people and to assist those venturing into the new business or expansion of their businesses. Mr. Speaker, since assuming office in July 2021, our actions have been consistent with our core philosophy of putting people first in administering the affairs of this country. In formulating this budget, we have placed great emphasis on addressing the immediate and pressing needs of most St. Lucians. For all these statements, I've outlined some policy measures to bring immediate relief to individuals, households, and companies. For further clarity, I will highlight some of these measures. One, subsidizing cooking gas. Two, increasing personal tax allowance from eighteen dollars to $25,000. Anybody getting less than $2,083 will pay no tax. Cushioning consumers from the full impact of rising fuel prices. Four, reducing personal income tax. Five, prioritizing the payment of tax refunds to taxpayers. Six, waiving interest and penalty charges on personal and company income tax. Seven, providing grants and soft loans funding for the youth economy. Eight, providing grants and soft loan funding for micro, soft, and medium-sized businesses. Nine, providing grants and soft loan funding for community-based tourism businesses. 10, 
funding for creative industries, carnival, and emancipation day celebrations. <coughs> Eleven waive of import duty of ten thousand dollars on vehicles for traveling officers in the public service. Twelve increasing the amount and range of support of of support services for vulnerable groups and reinstating the distress fund. Thirteen. Thirteen providing a five hundred dollar one off payment for pensioners. Fourteen increase salaries to public servants. 15. Subsidizing the price of rice and sugar to the consumers. Latest increases are valued at latest increases in the prices of these commodities. Rice, flour, brown sugar, and white sugar have kept these prices unchanged and it is, has cost the government $9.8 million. Mr. Speaker, I now come to the final leg of my 2023 budget presentation. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> if I look over. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm fully aware that the broad people centered and holistic transformation agenda that we have outlined will, prom will prompt our detractors to retreat behind the usual doubts. Too ambitious, they will say. Too much, too fast, they will say. Pie in the sky, they will scream. Interesting proposals, they will say. But how will you achieve all these things? You copied from us. And where is the revenue going to come from? They will ask. <laughs> but Mr. Speaker, it is often the case that the doubting Thomases are often the ones with no vision. Persons who do not understand are usually the most skeptical. To those who doubt our capacity to deliver on the goals that we have set, my response is very simple. Examine the historical record of the St. Lucia Labour Party, which I now have the honor to lead. And you will see, at every stage, when history has called upon us, to lead at moments of structural transformation and crises, we have stood up to the task and have boldly and steadfastly undertaken the measures that have taken the country into its next stage of development. When the world was ready to end 300 years of British rule, to move to the age of modern independent states, it was the St. Lucia Labour Party that ushered in the era of the popular labor nationalistic movement and for the struggle of universal adult suffrage in 1951, we took the reins of government and began the task of preparing St. Lucia for its post-colonial future. Who can forget that from 1997 to 2006, it was the St. Lucia Labor Party that was called back into government to manage the transition to the new post-banana economy and society. It was the St. Lucia Labour Party that ushered in the area of that ushered in the area of telecommunication, modernization, and liberalization. When others could not see beyond the power of a single monopolistic company from the colonial era. It was the St. Lucia Labour Party which gave birth to a new economy based on tourism, financial services, when the old political economy or preferential trade in the European market was coming to an end when, when others could not see a life after bananas. It was the St. Lucia Labour Party that gave birth to a new age of universal secondary education and modernize the education system when for others the common entrance was treated like the natural order of the universe that separated the fortunate few from the marginalized many who were condemned to a life of dashed hopes and frustrated dreams it was the saint lucia labor party which modernized the sports infrastructure of this country and gave us the Darren Sammy Cricket Ground and the George Odlum National Stadium when others 
did not have the vision to understand that in the new world of the knowledge economy and creative economies that the talent of our youth was our most precious commodity. It was a, it was a solution labor party which began the process of modernizing the health infrastructure of the country because we understood more than most that the health of a nation is the wealth of a nation and that everyone should have access to the most up-to-date health services available. That was our philosophy, Mr. Speaker, long before the COVID-19 pandemic. So you see, Mr. Speaker, I can go on and on, but I say to those who question our capacity to deliver, look at our record and examine our contribution to the development of St. Lucia at every critical juncture in our history since 1950. And to the people of St. Lucia, we say, trust in the leadership of this party. Protect the victory. Have confidence in the people who assess the global, regional, local situation and who fashion the policy programs in the budget that we have brought to the House for approval. To those who ask, where is the money coming from? I say, every proposal has been costed and accounted for. To those who say, how are we going to get all this done? I say, look closely, Mr. Speaker, and you will see that everything that we have proposed has been framed within the existing global, local, and regional arrangements which will provide technical and institutional support for our program. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I want to rem end by reminding all and by informing those who do not know, those who pretend not to know, and those who do not understand that this budget is framed within the deepest traditions of social democratic philosophy of the St. Lucia Labour Party. I have reminded the House that our, that our history shows that, I've, that at every stage it is the St. Lucia Labour Party that has intervened most decisively in moments of transition and modernization of our country. We have also intervened in moments of global crisis at critical junctures and in the periods of momentous change. But in addition to all this, Mr. Speaker, our interventions have always been shaped by our philosophy as a party of the working people. And we have always sought to ensure that whatever policies we pursue in, pursue in response to the global crisis, that their benefits are spread evenly throughout the country and that they are aimed at the betterment of the lives of all. <clears throat> In short, Mr. Speaker, we are party of the many and not the few. We are government of all the people and not the specially chosen. And so it is, Mr. Speaker, in the case of these budgetary proposals, which we have framed around the theme, transforming our economy and empowering our people. It is widely agreed that the current war in Ukraine and in the global crisis still reeling from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, this is one of the most challenging periods in post-independence history of St. Lucia. No other government since independence has had to contend with the fallout from a simultaneous crisis of a two-year global health crisis and, slowed down, and a slowed down world economy and the European war of global proportions that has seen record levels of inflation, which rises at prospects of an energy crisis and threatens basic food shortages. Yet, despite all of this, our proposals have been framed to once again make decisive interventions that are aimed at ushering in a new period of post-colonial transformation and modernization and to take St. Lucia to its next stage of development. And at the same time, we are remaining true to our core principles of equity, fairness, inclusiveness, and economic democratization. You can see this in the key economic and social measures that we have proposed. Our MSME loan grant scheme, our programs for economic recovery of youth and women, our community-based tourism programs, 
our initiatives for the creative industries, our bee city project, our cannabis initiatives, our plans for cocoa, seamoss, and fisheries, our school laptop programs, our plans for the youth economy, and our digital transformation program. All of these have been deliberately conceptualized to achieve two related purposes. They are intended to modernize and transform our society and economy, while at the same time providing avenues for ordinary solutions to take a stake and equal share in the economy and to transform their lives for the better. In doing so, Mr. Speaker, we are confident that we are fulfilling the vision of our founding fathers for a progressive, united, healthy, educated, just, an equitable society aware of its history, but marching proudly towards a new future founded on the ideals of bread, freedom, and justice. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, in times of doubt, I comfort myself with the words. Hear my voice, O God. In my prayer, preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked, from the plot of evildoers. They sharpen their tongues like swords and aim cruel words like deadly arrows. But in times of hope, Mr. Speaker, the righteousness will rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. I thank you.